Your Space Coast vacation is preparing for liftoff. Start counting down now. 10, 9, 8, 7. It's time for a beach vacay that feels like heaven. 6, 5, 4. Come explore Melbourne and the beaches. 3, 2, 1. It's time for some rocket-filled fun. Countdown to your best beach vacation ever on Florida Space Coast. Launch your planning now at visitspacecoast.com. That's visitspacecoast.com. Ah, feel the whoa with Listerine at BJ's. You can save $2.50 now on Listerine products like Total Care Anti-Cavity Fluoride Fresh Mint Mouthwash or Cool Mint Pocket Packs Fresh Breath Strips at your nearest BJ's location. Experience the feeling of a million germs zapped in seconds with Listerine. Discount available through December 24th. Save now only at BJ's. Welcome to the Wellness Transcription Podcast, the podcast that combines the power of Christian values with evidence-based nutrition, fitness, and lifestyle content. I'm your host, Dr. Patrick Early. Join me each week as we explore the intersections of Christianity and wellness, offering you insights to help nourish your body, mind, and soul. Whether you're looking to improve your physical health or simply strengthen your personal relationship with Jesus, we've got you covered. Stay tuned for inspiring discussions, expert guests, interviews, and practical tips to help you live the life God calls us to live. All right, guys, thank you for coming back to another episode of the Wellness Transcription Podcast. It's been a while. I've had to revamp some things and, and restart some things, but I have a returning guest, Ryan. You're the first returning guest on the show. So thanks for being here. Guys, we, I think it was episode two that we put out or two or three actually, where I think me and Ryan were doing a real deep dive on cholesterol and what all that looks like. And today I think we're going to talk about a, an area that your healthcare provider most likely hasn't talked to you about yet. And that's not only just your typical cholesterol lab tool, we're going to be talking about the risks and all that associated with something that's called remnant cholesterol. So if that's a new term for you guys, this is something that I think you'll find pretty beneficial. Me and Ryan work pretty well together in this field, and we're trying to really figure out a better way to educate people about all the pieces of how all this works together. So with that being said, Ryan, I appreciate you being here. Thank you for taking time out of your day to chat with me. And I, you know, I could talk to you for hours. So I just appreciate you being here and being so willing to help educate people about stuff that's so important. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Pat. You know how much, uh, Patrick, you know how much I love to educate. So uh, just whenever you're ready. uh, This was something that I wasn't very familiar with as a healthcare provider. Now I have a little bit more extensive training and nutrition and other things. I've heard of these words before, but in practice, I just don't really see it very often. So that's this concept of really focusing on remnant cholesterol. And even if your cholesterol labs are good, so to speak, that you may not necessarily be out of the woods as far as risk goes. For the audience listening, if you go to your doctor's office and you get your typical cholesterol panel checked, you're looking at your total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and maybe triglycerides. That's about it. And your doctor will either say it's good or bad. And if it's bad, typically what they'll do is they'll start what's called a statin medication that you would pick up from someone like me at a pharmacy. And then we go from there. And that's usually it. You're usually on the statin for a long period of time. And then depending on how labs go, depends on if you go up or down in dose. But remnant cholesterol is not something that's rarely ever checked, but it can be easily calculated. So me and Ryan are going to go into details about it. So Ryan, what can you tell us just in generally what remnant cholesterol is and why we should be concerned about it? What's what's the literature say? Because it's something that's kind of hitting this, hitting, capturing researchers and clinicians attention as far as stuff to pay up, to pay attention for. Yeah, Patrick, to me, uh, as a practitioner as well, licensed pharmacists, we know that we focus on LDL and specifically statins and study after study has shown the benefit of statins in certain individuals. And what I mean by certain individuals is that there was a landmark study published in 2009 
where the investigators looked at several hundred thousand events, cardiovascular events across the nation. And what they were looking at was how many of those folks had lipid panels. And they found that there were a little over 100,000 of those folks had a lipid panel. And what stood out to them is that literally 75% of those with cardiovascular events had, quote, normal or target, well, mm -hmm. this is a better way to put it, target at um, LDL levels. So it really started this conversation or really, I guess it added momentum to this conversation around, okay, if LDL lowering represents 20 to 30 percent and mm -hmm. pick your number, but it's still a minority of the overall risk. What are the other factors that come into play when you're trying to assess your risk factors? Yeah, we're going to stay in the lipid space. We're not going to talk today about, we may, about really interesting inflammation mm -hmm. markers, right? We are familiar with reactive protein. We'll maybe leave that for another day, but we'll stay in the lipid space. And specifically, what other information can we glean from a typical lipid panel and move off of an LDL sort of centric interpretation of the panel? And so if we take a step back and we say total cholesterol, what does total cholesterol represent? We know that total cholesterol, obviously a component mm -hmm. that is LDL. And most of your listeners are familiar with what we call the LDL, right? The bad mm -hmm. cholesterol, the villain, if you will. And then we know that HDL is the so-called good cholesterol. So now you've got total cholesterol, that, which is comprised of LDL plus HDL, but there's a third component of that total cholesterol that receives very little airtime, if you will, outside the research, the clinical research community. And that are these triglyceride rich remnant proteins, okay, lipid proteins. So basically the, the measure, the difference between total cholesterol, LDL and HDL are these so-called VLDLs. These VLDLs, again, as I said, carry uh, a lot of our triglycerides such that if we compare VLDL levels to triglyceride direct measurement, mm -hmm. they're pretty close. There's an association, not a strict association. There are differences, but there's a really good correlation. And so what this VLDL, this triglyceride carrying co cholesterol component has become known as one name is remnant cholesterol. So there's been a lot of research around what contribution is remnant cholesterol to that residual risk. And so the research is showing that it actually contributes highly to the residual risk related to cardiovascular mm -hmm. events. And so this is important because now it starts to raise sort of this idea about, okay, since they are triglyceride carrying, it brings triglycerides back into the mix in terms of discussion about residual risk. We'll come back to that. But first to your listeners, say, okay, it's a real simple number to calculate. So I have my total cholesterol, that's equal to my LDL plus my HDL plus my remnant cholesterol or VLDL, these triglyceride carrying rods. So it's really that simple. If I know my total cholesterol, I can subtract my LDL, I can subtract my HDL, and the leftover, the remaining, the residual, is that remnant cholesterol, VLDL, triglyceride mm -hmm. carrying. So that's where a lot of research is focusing now on remnant cholesterol. That's how to calculate that's why it's important in terms of the residual. Yeah, I think uh, a couple of important points is, that I like to make is there's, it, it's a big part of the equation, which going back to that study you first alluded to where they looked at over a hundred thousand patients and the rates of risk and events that were going on. It says before admission, I'm looking at the paper now, it says that only 21% of patients had received some form of lipid lowering medication before they were admitted for the event. That's important too, is those labs may look fine and the doctor may go, you don't need a statin or you don't need something right now, just lifestyle changes, things like that. You'll be fine. Well, from a, a patient perspective, you hear, okay, I mean, doctor said I'm good. I'm not at risk for an event. When in reality, it, you still could be, you just don't really know. Uh, another thing is that was done in 2009. So I'd be hard pressed to think if you repeated that study now that it, those numbers would probably be higher. 
I think the statin rate is pretty standard now. However, there are a lot of side effects that statins do bring about that, that is definitely going to impact compliance as far as that goes. And again, that statin may get that LDL quote, bad cholesterol in range, but that doesn't, if you're not looking at the other pieces of the puzzle, like you're talking about, we're not looking at remnant cholesterol. We're not really factoring in the impact triglycerides have in that whole process. We're just, we might be missing a big piece of the puzzle as far as getting all that in check goes. So, I mean, here's another part. It says almost half the LDL levels were less than hundred milligrams per deciliter. More than half the patients have admission HDL levels less than 40, whereas less than 10% have HDL levels greater than 60. What that means, LDL looks okay. HDL is in the majority of patients, more than half were subpar. 40 is for female, I minimum would like it to be 45 to 50, probably higher if you can for females. Males can get away with a little bit less, so 45 or higher for them is usually okay. But that's one part of the pharmacological piece of it all is there's really not anything available behind the counter, like prescription wise, or even over the counter that really affects HDL to any degree. The only thing that was used clinically for a long time was niacin that did actually impact HDL levels a good bit, but you had to take very high doses of it. And I can tell you as someone who's taken too many B vitamins at once before, that it is not fun. I was driving home from, or I was driving to work at the pharmacy when I was in pharmacy school and I had taken my supplements that morning and I'd forgotten I was doing something else. So I took my supplements again. And normally that's not a problem, like you know, nothing to worry about, but I'm driving to work and it's like a cold December day. And I'm like, man, I'm warm what is happening like i don't I'm, this doesn't feel right this feel i'm like i'm this is not good i look in my rear view i look in my mirror and i am i look like a lobster like i am, I am deer paint red <laughs> everywhere and i'm like that's not good maybe i'm like you know something's wrong like, oh no i took too much of my niacin like too much of my b vitamins that niacin's what's causing this flushing i got to work and my boss goes did you go to the beach this weekend and just stay there so it, it's <laughs> It, it, it's interesting because you can still use high dose niacin as a prescription, but again, it's so rough on the system that a lot of times doctors are like, patients aren't going to stick with this. So there's really, as far as getting HDL up, they just say, eat more fatty fish and kind of keep your, you know, exercise and all that in check and it might go up, but that's a whole other piece of the puzzle too. I just thought that was interesting about that study because it's, it's really startling when you think about it. Cause I mean, if your levels can be that good and you still have events, I mean, you're talking about just about everybody at that point is at risk for those things. Yeah. So I think it's really important to understand the math yeah. and how to calculate the VLDL. So again, to your listeners, I'll use VLDL and remnant cholesterol mm -hmm. interchangeably. I point that out because technically remnant cholesterol is your VLDL, right. yeah, IDL. intermediate density. So IDL, I think your listeners need to know that as well. So I am fudging a little bit and lumping in IDL and VLDL, but so your readers know that, but that's important because for two reasons, one is VLDL, when it interacts with HDL, we'll talk mm -hmm. about that in a minute to offload a lot of these bad lipids. As it decreases in size, the VLDL, then that's what becomes mm -hmm. the LDL. So it's said differently, VLDL through interaction with HDL is turned into mm -hmm. LDL. And so that's important for two reasons is if you talk about LDL, we know that there are really it, two components to that LDL. There's one that's non-genetically determined and one that's genetically determined. So you'll hear patients and practitioners talk about at L mm -hmm. little a, but basically that's your portion of LDL that is bound to another lipoprotein, apolipoprotein A, and it's genetically determined mm -hmm. for the most part. And so it doesn't appear that statins impact that portion of LDL to any great extent. So I always like to give patients some rationale. like you may be on a high dose statin and you still have this stubbornly high LDL. It could be that you have that genetic component of LDL that just remains stubbornly high. So keep that in mind as you're talking about LDL and where LDL comes from, ultimately it comes from VLDL, remnant cholesterol, okay? So the other part of that in terms of relationships is we know that remnant cholesterol is in balance 
with your HDL. So they interact. So in other words, the LDL is carrying those triglycerides. It's carrying that free cholesterol. And so through interacting with HDL, VLDL offloads those triglycerides to HDL. It offloads that free cholesterol to HDL. And so that's the other reason why you want to have higher HDL levels. You've got to have a sink, right? Those free cholesterol and triglyceride molecules from VLDL ideally go to HDL. So if you look at numbers, typically what you'll see is an inverse relationship. If you have high remnant cholesterol, you'll have low HDL and vice versa. These are generalizations, but if you're just looking at your numbers and that makes sense because HDL is that sink for those triglycerides and free cholesterol that are coming from the remnant cholesterol. So that's the other really important reason to understand what that remnant cholesterol number is. And then in relation to mm -hmm. your HDL, it gives you some idea of how well mm -hmm. you're clearing, not only clearing your triglycerides or not, but what's the source of those triglycerides. It's, then you get into the next step, which is really, okay, if I have high remnant cholesterol and I have low HDL, what mm -hmm. options do I have? And I think that's where I think your listeners might be interested to say, okay, First, where do those VLDLs come from and why might I have an overload of yeah, those VLDLs? I'll make two important points because I would say, I want to say it's around 20% of the cholesterol and is impacted by diet. So that's what's called exogenous cholesterol. So you've got, you eat something with fat in it, it gets broken down, it's sterified, and then into the bile, and then it gets absorbed by things called chylomicrons. Chylomicrons transport those across the intestinal barrier into the liver where they're then packaged and done. So that, that is, so when people say, oh, you know, my doctor said that in order to get my cholesterol down, I have to eat, you know, less eggs or less cholesterol rich foods and, it, and vice versa. You're, <laughs> all that stuff might be okay to do. I don't caution reducing. It doesn't make much of a difference in my opinion. If you eat foods that are higher in cholesterol, there's a lot of healthier foods that are, it really doesn't move the needle there as much. So that's an important piece to keep in mind is what we're really talking about with these risk factors is more of endogenous production of, of cholesterol, which is your liver, one of your liver's primary jobs is the production and packaging of these things. An important thing you mentioned IDL earlier too, and it's important for people to go, okay, well, I, my, I, let's say I calculated my remnant, but I don't know what my IDL is. IDLs Intermediate for a reason, it's half life is very short. It gets quickly converted to VLDL pretty fast. Yeah, or yeah, LDL, LDL pretty quickly. Yeah. Like both, it's a fast process. So it's really, even if you were to, able to measure it, it's like it's not necessarily very useful because it's so hard to kind of catch. You'd have to get the lab measures done really, really quickly. But yeah, I think for most people on statins, again, if we're only looking at one piece of the puzzle, we're just, we're missing things. And then again, it's what else can you do to kind of, affect the other things because the reason HDL is oftentimes referred to as good cholesterol or it's very, it helps a lot with reverse cholesterol transport, which is what you mentioned, but without saying reverse cholesterol transport, it helps take that cholesterol back up, send it back to the liver where it gets recycled and reused. But again, if your HDL is low, we're dumping off more LDL and cholesterol rich things than we are actually recycling it back. And then your triglycerides go up and it's all just kind of this vicious cycle. So thank you for eloquently explaining that one. But those are, those are some things that are important to keep in mind too. That yeah. So what do you want to do as a patient, as a healthcare practitioner? You know that statins are in your armamentarium for lowering the LDL. Mm -hmm. Great. If, if they work in your patients, use right. It's, you know, best in your patients. I think the other piece where we're bringing up here, these residual risk factors is, okay, how do we reduce remnant mm -hmm. cholesterol and how do we increase our HDL? And so we said they're related. So you can impact both in, in a decreased VLDL, increase HDL and have an added potential synergistic effect. And so the other part of that is when those VLDLs via IDL are converted to LDL, recognize that removes the triglycerides. In other words, LDLs right. do not carry triglycerides. LDLs, right, and that's the process of going from VLDL to IDL to LDL. So that's the other. Remnant cholesterol is that triglyceride carrying component lipoprotein. LDL is not. So that's the other reason to focus on those triglycerides. 
And you appropriately pointed out. Your Space Coast vacation is preparing for liftoff. Start counting down now. 10, 9, 8, 7. It's time for a beach vacay that feels like heaven. 6, 5, 4. Come explore Melbourne and the beaches. 3, 2, 1. It's time for some rocket-filled fun. Countdown to your best beach vacation ever on Florida Space Coast. Launch your planning now at visitspacecoast.com. That's visitspacecoast.com. Those triglycerides are formed initially in the liver. And we can talk for three podcasts about how triglycerides, excess triglycerides get into the liver, but we'll save that for another day. But the bottom line is, to be able to impact remnant cholesterol, you've got to be able to impact synthesis of these remnant cholesterol, these VLDL molecules in the liver. And this is where it gets really fascinating, Patrick, because we really don't talk about this in pharmacy school, medical school, pharmacology, pharmacology in general, excuse me. Uh, and for me, it's most exciting because the first mm-hmm. step Okay, if you're going to reduce VLDL, what's the literal first step in the liver? The first step begins with apolipoprotein B100 mm-hmm. synthesis. So for the nerd listeners like myself that you have today, right, it's called ApoB100 simply because it uses 100% of the amino acids in the gene for mm-hmm. ApoB. That's why it's called OP. Will be 100. It's one of the largest proteins in the body. It's like over 4,500 amino acids. 100 just means that when you synthesize VLDL and you create that first step, ApoB100, it's using every one of those amino acids. But that's important to distinguish because if you, the first part of uh, translating that ApoB100 into hepatocyte it only uses the first 100 or so amino acids to begin Mm -hmm. the process. Why that's important is if you look at the lipid composition of that ApoB100 beginning there in that patocyte, it is 70% phosphatidylcholines. It only has 12 molecules of triglyceride. It only has six molecules of cholesterol and it has 50 molecules of phosphatidylcholine. And so step one in synthesizing triglyceride-rich VLDL that are ultimately secreted into the bloodstream is comprised of phosphatidylcholines. And so you've got to really understand how phosphatidylcholines play into that synthesis. Okay. So that's where my interest is, as you know, Patrick, it says, All right, it's not just phosphatidylcholines because there are literally thousands of different species of phosphatidylcholines that are produced by the liver. What's fascinating to me is it's the right ratio of polyunsaturated fatty acid as well as saturated fatty acid containing phosphatidylcholines. If you get a disruption in that balance, what happens is that ApoB100 is degraded. It never gets converted, goes to the next step where now you start piling on the triglycerides and you start piling on the cholesterol and the cholesterol esters and it matures and then it's secreted. And so if you mess up that first step with those phosphatidylcholines, then it degrades. Guess what happens? That means those triglycerides stay in the liver. That cholesterol stays in the liver. And you know what that is? That's the big fatty liver disease, right? Those lipid droplets. And so if you don't get those phosphatidylcholines right on the front end, you don't get efficient synthesis of VLDLs. You don't get efficient secretion of triglycerides, lipids from the liver, and you don't get them out there in the plasma where they can interact with HDL molecules and thereby strip them of their triglycerides and free cholesterol. That's what HDL does. So that's component one of why those phosphatidylcholine molecules and metabolism in particular are so critical. But there's a second piece. So that's how I just explained how it impacts the VLDL side of the VLDL, remnant cholesterol, HDL. But how does it Mm -hmm. affect HDL itself? And we know that there's certain polyunsaturated fatty acid containing phosphatidylcholines that promote 
HDL synthesis. Said differently, if you have the right mixture, including polyunsaturated fatty acids, EPA and DHA in particular, then you promote synthesis of HDL in the plasma through interaction with the enzyme LCAT or less than cholesterol acetyl transferase LCAT. So now you start to see if remnant cholesterol and HDL are critical and they relate with each other, right? One offloads triglycerides and free cholesterol, the other in exchange for cholesterol esters, right? That's what's transferred back to VLDL. If you look at phosphatidylcholines, it impacts that VLDL synthesis and secretion. It impacts the HDL. So it tends to decrease VLDL, remnant cholesterol, and it HDL. tends to increase HDL. That's where we are now in terms of the conversation as, as far as a new mechanism. No one, to my knowledge, besides us, are talking about that mm -hmm. as a mechanism. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about high-dose synthetic EPA for triglycerides in patients that are, have high triglycerides and aren't impacted by statins. I, I don't know if you saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, the EMA, Medical, Association. EMA, Medical mm -hmm. Association. Thank you. I, they came out and stated strongly that looking at the evidence in toto, that you should really watch your patients that are taking high dose EPA for triglycerides for increased instance of mm, AFib. Yep. Right. They said it is causing. So in other words, if you look back at all the meta-analyses, if you're above one gram per day of EPA, your risk of AFib starts to increase. For every gram per day above one gram per day, you get about a 10% increase in risk. So that when you get up to four grams per day, which was the reduce it trial, you see an increase in AFib risk of almost 50%. And so now you start to say, well, okay, we really don't have a lot of great options. You talked about niacin. When I say options, options are treating high triglycerides. And now you know why that's important. Remnant cholesterol in the context, particularly of low HDL. And so if we don't have a lot of options, we, we do have five options. Region, but five again, I don't, I don't, it, right? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't see a lot as a pharmacist and I do a lot of pharmacy stuff, let's be honest. I fill a lot of prescriptions in a lot of different age groups and patient demographics. So it, I see kind of what's routine and what's not. I rarely see phenofibrates used anymore. Now is, does that mean it's not used more frequently? No, but however, it, I just don't see it. They also come with side effects too, that are pretty rough. They are kind of hard on the liver a little bit and they do they have their own set of, again, no drug is without side effects. So if you're stacking a statin and a, and a phenofibrate together, you know, you can, depending on which ones they are, you may be helping yourself from a blood marker perspective, but if you're causing, if you're increasing the likelihood for them to see adverse effects, they're just not going to be compliant with it. And then we're back to square one. It, it, it's a whole other important thing. I, I want to interject one, uh, one more time and I'll let you get back to go because it's fascinating to me because like you said, no one's talking about this because no one really understands what's going on. I read a book a long time ago and I've Pretty sure, yeah, it was one of the fasting books I remember. I think it was Dr. Fung's fasting book I read a few years ago. And he made an offhand comment in the book that just didn't, it stuck with me, but I don't know why I remember it. And he was talking about how, you know, when you eat too much, you have insulin resistance, like all these fats get, have to get deposited in different tissues. So that's, what, and then they go to the liver first. And it's like, that's what causes fatty liver disease. In my head, I'm just like, that's, it's, that's not that simple. Like, it's not just that part. Now that may play in for sure. Because a lot of times in diabetics, when we see insulin resistance and all these other issues, we're also going to see cholesterol issues and those go hand in hand. However, your mechanism and what I'm hearing and what we've talked about for hours off mic, off recording is this seems to make more sense from a mechanistic standpoint of why we're seeing the fatty liver disease rates we're seeing, why these things are going up because they're all, everything it's important to remember, everything in the body is tied together. So you, you, as clinicians, I think if we're in pharmacy school, we oftentimes tend to compartmentalize certain areas. So it'll be like, oh, we're talking about cholesterol. We know that affects uh, diabetes and stuff, but then we're talking about other things. So AFib is never brought up as far as I'm concerned with like cholesterol and, and synthesis works in the system. And if you get one of these off or others, it just kind of compounds. But that's really important. 
that you mentioned that because I, th I think, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll pick yeah. up there right where you teed it up. So right, uh, Dr. Fong, nephrologist, Canadian nephrologist, right, big believer in intermittent fasting. If I remember correctly, the, the book is called Obesity mm -hmm. Code, that really fascinating ideas about how you change fatty acid metabolism in the liver. And I think that's a really important point here because it ties into what we're talking about. So again, regardless of how you get fatty acids formed, whether it's coming from the adipocyte, right? Breakdown and fatty acids are transported, pre-fatty acids are back, transported back to the liver, or we're talking about fructose or glucose that through de novo lipogenesis are forming these fatty acids and then combining them with glycerol molecules, right? We know that those fatty acids combine with glycerol to form monoacyl fries for glycerol. But why I painstakingly go through that step-by-step -step is at the stage of diacylglycerol. The diacylglycerol has at least two pathways, two primary pathways it can take. It can have an additional fatty acid attached and turn into a triacylglycerol, right? Triglyceride. But what most people don't talk about is that diacylglycerol is also a precursor for phosphatidylcholine mm -hmm. synthesis. And so if you have properly operating phosphatidylcholine synthesis, it's consuming a number of those diacylglyceride molecules that are produced in the liver. Said differently, those diacylglyceride molecules that are going into phosphatidylcholines are not going into triglycerides and mm -hmm. vice versa. And so that's yet another reason and link between proper phosphatidylcholine metabolism and fat production and deposition mm -hmm. in the liver. So the idea is this, if you can figure out how to positively impact phosphatidylcholine metabolism, you can potentially impact remnant cholesterol and HDL and all the downstream things that are related things, pathophysiologies that are related that we know about and that we mm -hmm. don't know about that are, we're just starting to appreciate and some of the things we're seeing anecdotally in the patients that are taking this supplement that, that's been developed by, you know, my group over the last few years. And so it's a unique mechanism. It focuses solely, not primarily, it focuses solely on the nutritional deficiencies that we see in patients that impact phosphatidylcholine metabolism, completely natural. And so therefore, I think that's why we're seeing some of the really cool results that we're seeing in patients when it comes to alterations in lipid panels. Yeah, they, it's very important. Yeah, there's a piece that no one's talking about. And the fact that we, that you've developed a, a potential answer to that, I mean, it's, uh, I've seen it work, is very important. I, I just, it's, maybe my mind can go in all sorts of different things. I'm looking at this. Yeah, I mean, there's really never been an, an answer to how do we get those ratios correct? You know, normally, and well, I mentioned this before on the last podcast I had you on, normally they'll go, okay, well, EPA and DHA, we know are good and the ratios for what? So high quality fish oils. And so it's like, let's do that. Let's exercise. Let's do some other things. And you're kind of hoping at that point, you don't really know how all that gets utilized. And I think that's so important where the sesame component comes in is because I was looking, I was just curious. I was looking into a lot of the studies just out of sesame oil in general and their effects on cardiometabolic risk factors and things like that. And time again, in all the papers you see, LDL goes down, HDL goes up, triglycerides drop. Like it's over and over. You see in multiple systematic reviews, it's like people who utilize this and have this as a mainstay of their diet, that there is market improvements. And then every study that I saw says they need to figure out mechanistically how this is going on and why this is happening. Cause it just, it looks good, but we just don't know why. And I think that's, you've kind of really teased that out, I think. And it's been, it's that missing piece because a lot of times when people see these changes happening in the liver and metabolism, they tend to over, oversimplify what's actually going on. And I, to my knowledge, I've never heard of it before getting involved with you and talking about this and kind of getting into the weeds. I have never heard of phosphatidylcholine being a part of that to any great degree. Only on a handful of podcasts is it mentioned, but it's never the mainstay of the conversation. So I think that's really, 
Yeah. Well, it's interesting, Patrick, because the it's like anything else. The literature is out there. There are some brilliant biochemists who have worked out VLDL synthesis and the role of phosphatidylcholine, the role of the ratio of phosphatidylcholine to phosphatidylcholine, the role of triglycerides, et cetera. There are brilliant biochemists who have worked out how phosphatidylcholines impact the HDL, but that's been sort of in your silos where that's what you're funded to do as a researcher and you do some really interesting work, but no one, to my knowledge, at least outwardly and in podcasts like this is talking about how you pull all that information together to provide a potential, I keep emphasizing potential solution for patients. And I was in the military for a number of years, and one of my favorite things, I had a boss that always told me, said, Peter L.C. Yates, don't come to me with a problem until mm -hmm. you have a solution. And so a lot of people have problems, but it's frustrating as a practitioner if you know there's 75% uh, residual cardiovascular ri risk, but you don't have anything to tell patients. And I'm not suggesting for one second that this supplement right. of the beer or treatment, mitigation, whatever, would never say that. But what I would say is it begins to address the nutritional deficiencies and by definition, right, in accordance with the Deshaies Dietary Supplement Health Education Act is a supplement to diet which can positively impact phosphatidylcholine metabolism and thus through mechanisms that are completely, I don't say complete, you're never completely, but are really well characterized will have an impact on these different lipid parameters. These are known pathways. You just have to be able to impact them in a positive way without causing mm -hmm. harm. And when we take the reductionist approach of everything is sort of a pharma, it's a one size fits all, it EPA is really good. And now we're going to give you four grams per day of a synthetic MP, uh, EPA right, extroversion, then that's going to be even better. Well, the data are clear and the EMA is spoken and cardiologists in the world have spoken. That's not okay. There are side effects when you take the reductionist approach. So why don't we do what nature does? Take a step back and say, this is a system pharmacology. This is a multifactorial process. I don't need to shove four grams of EPA into somebody to achieve effect, I need to have some, a way to impact polyunsaturated fatty acid metabolism, step number one. And then those downstream events that augment that proper diet. And believe me, I'm not here even advocating taking official supplement. I'm here advocating eat your fatty fish once a week, twice, whatever the first recommendations too, are. I think the, ab the average recommendation from the USDA, the food organizations here, as well as in the EM, EMA and all that stuff. I want to say it's minimum two a week if you can. Ideally, three, two to three it seems to be the sweet spot. Now, again, if you eat them every, if you're pescatarian and you, that's the only meat source you have, that's fine. Yeah. But yeah. But I guess my point is that it's, yes, it always starts with eat right and exercise. But in this case, it stop there because that's what's the frustrating things for patients sometimes is that's difficult to understand what it of means. Course. Eat, right saying, eat right and exercise. Eat right and exercise doesn't work How do you either. It just kind of gives you nothing to go off of. So, yeah. If you can give your liver the dietary ingredients it needs to process those proper dietary inputs, those essential fatty acids, to me, that's a much better approach than inhibiting. I, I mean, I've been in drug discovery for over 20 something years. And the most common approach is something is uh, going to arrive, let's inhibit a basic process, uh, whether it's beta block. I mean, Again, I'm not cast throwing shade at those. Those are important, but it's always let's mm -hmm. block a process as opposed to how do we augment what we know to be a beneficial process to attack not the symptom, Correct. but rather the ultimate cause for uh, pathophysiology. And that's what my, you know, I'm acting sure. as a big proponent here. How do we augment what people are doing from a prescription and dietary standpoint to achieve an even better yeah, health uh, outcome. There was a point you made earlier about the study with AFib and EPA risk and stuff. And it's like, okay, let's say, I mean, if that's well established in the literature, I think I went through that paper you sent me on that one. That's a very, a very interesting link. I would have 
you know, a normal practitioner would never thought about that as being an issue, but obviously there's pattern there. And if there's enough people saying this is causative, then there's good data to back it up. However, if you were doing that, let's say you had an imbalance there of polyunsaturated fatty acids and metabolism and stuff, and we've now progressed into an AFib situation. From a pharmacological standpoint, as a pharmacist, there's only really conductive medications or beta blockers that can help with that. Your Space Coast vacation is preparing for liftoff. Start counting down now. 10, 9, 8, 7. It's time for a beach vacay that feels like heaven. 6, 5, 4. Come explore Melbourne and the beaches. 3, 2, 1. It's time for some rocket-filled fun. Countdown to your best beach vacation ever on Florida's Space Coast. Launch your planning now at visitspacecoast.com. That's visitspacecoast.com. Ah, feel the whoa with Listerine at BJ's. You can save $2.50 now on Listerine products like Total Care Anti-Cavity Fluoride Fresh Mint Mouthwash or Cool Mint Pocket Packs Fresh Breath Strips at your nearest BJ's location. Experience the feeling of a million germs zapped in seconds with Listerine. Discount available through December 24th. Save now only at BJ's. You're looking at your medications like your amiodarones, your propafenones, like other things for different AFEBs and beta blockers. And that's about it. Like they only touch the circuitry part of the cardiovascular issue that they have because they need to get that under control immediately. But as far as looking at the liver side of things, that's just not done, at least in a hospital setting. And I don't think that's something that they need to look at. I think that's something from a primary care a pharmacist standpoint, like, Hey, this is what my labs look like. What could I do to impact these to, to minimize even having to go down that route in the future? And all this ties back into remnant cholesterol risk. Cause it's like, if you only go to your doctor, for, you know, maybe a year or every six months or something and you check everything and he just says all good, you're going to keep going about your business. But if he says, Hey, your labs look good, but your remnant cholesterol is looking a little bit off the ratios off. Then you can then have some additional guidance as to how to control that to further minimize your risk. Because it's very interesting, the papers that you've sent me and that I've looked at myself and how all this would impact ASCBD scores. Because in the pharmacy world, that is the gold standard. What's their ASCBD risk? And then what can we do to minimize it? In pharmacy school, I heard this a hundred times, calculate their ASCBD risk score. And then what would you do to, you know, decrease that risk? The answer was always this exercise and lifestyle change. And if they're smoking, stop smoking. That was the extent, that was the extent of it. Very rarely until now, I would have never made the link to, oh, well, we've got to make sure the liver's metabolizing polyunsaturated fatty acids correctly. And that those ratios are correct. And we have to have a way to, to, to get those in check and provide a solution. Otherwise you're just diagnosing another problem and saying, well, we'll figure it out in 10 years when the science is there. So I think it's, I, I've, the product that you've developed and stuff with assessment and all that and other, in the extra mile you guys went to make sure we have enough methyl donors in there and make sure we're further facilitating that process and not just throwing sesame, sesame at it and seeing in real time, how all that plays into effect, it only solidifies mechanistically that what you're saying makes the most sense. I mean, it's pretty obvious if, when you lay it out the way that it's laid out, that it works. And again, I'm not saying like you were, I'm not saying that the assessment is going to be the end all be all like cure or anything. I don't like using the word cure because it's not, uh, that term gets thrown around all the time and it, it's bothersome, but again, it, uh, having a dietary supplement and nutrition component that you can easily change with minimal side effects without having to go up on that statin you're already on. You know, let's say it, there's just so many implications there and I think it's just going to make it easier on patients for compliance purposes. Than your, it's, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but I think it's very intriguing that we that we finally getting some real answers to these problems that people have been able to diagnose, but not solve for a long time or mitigate, I guess is a better word to say it. And, and the bottom line is it, it's not a problem that Correct. has been solved. And so what I'm suggesting through my approach is that we rethink how we approach 
these different parameters, again, without using sure. these terms, et cetera, but how do we approach it from a nutritional standpoint? And I think the other part we want to point out is that there is a rare allergy to yep. sesame. And by allergy, it's, um, it's well known enough that the Food and Drug Administration points that out to people. It just says, hey, if you have an allergy to sesame, then you shouldn't be using sesame mm -hmm. seed oil or you shouldn't be consuming sesame seeds, right? Which is the old McDonald's, right? Two all beef patty special sauce, mm -hmm. but kind of sesame seed buns, right? So anything sesame. So nothing even in nature comes without right. risk. But as long as you're aware of what that risk is, then you can make better decisions. And that's what I'm saying with this lipid panel. There's so much more information baked into that lipid panel that we have to tease out. Now, I told you offline that I had an individual who is highly trained and has a medical background who basically said that the lipid panel really wasn't useful in his practice. And so we've just talked about the sort of counter way to think about that. And we hope we've given you guys something to think about and go out and read more. But a lot of what we're talking about has occurred in the last 10 to 15 years. And that's sort of science and clinical science. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So in other words, the good news is, is we're always moving forward. We're always trying to improve upon it. The bad is that well, the, the other good of that is, well, well, we'll talk about that. The bad is things change very slowly in terms of practice and research. And that's, even though it's a bad thing, it changes slowly. It's actually good because we don't want to be changing with the wind. You don't want to be changing practice guidelines every mm -hmm. 10, 15, probably even 20 years. But you have to be aware of what cutting edge mm -hmm. science is saying and say, how can I translate that to my patient as the science catches up with sort of the recommendations and it becomes and reaffirmed. So let's go back to the AFib with the EPA. This was a meta-analysis pub published in the journal Circulation, a really high profile, highly respected journal that said that's their conclusion after looking at the reduced trial, the, uh, all the other trials and said, there's something to this. And for the EMA to come out and say something, right, that's what I mean by it takes years to really get something to change practice guidelines. But that doesn't mean you have to wait mm -hmm. for your patients to try things that make yeah. sense. There, there's an important thing that I, I think that I want to tease out is, and I think as a patient, again, it's really hard for me to take my scientist credential hat off. If I'm thinking like a patient, and this can be applied just about anything medically. It's like, well, I don't trust what the, my, these experts are telling me because it seems like every 10 to 20 years, like what they said was for sure the way to go is not necessarily what they end up changing. And I think science is meant to change. Otherwise it doesn't progress anywhere. So as scientists, when you have an expert telling you, well, I don't know the evidence isn't there yet. I'm not sure. That's not them just saying, I don't know what you're talking about. It's that this. I can't speak for the solidification of the science because you never know where it's going to go and you have to constantly adapt and change things. Now, as far as treatment guidelines go for ASCVD and things like that and cholesterol, I don't see them changing very frequently. However, if you can come up with an option nutritionally or from a, a supplement area that helps facilitate making those guidelines work better, because again, I'm not saying that like this product that you've come up with is going to magically get everyone off their statin. That's not how, that's not how I see it going. There's too much of a benefit for statin therapy in patients with heart disease that you can help augment to where we're not dealing with just pushing this, just turning the statin lever from zero to 10 and hoping for the best. You're really helping all the other aspects of this mechanism that aren't being impacted to be impacted then you have to use less medication potentially. I, again, I, that's one of the hard things because people say, oh, I just don't trust, I don't trust the scientists because it feels like they're, it's always changing. It's like, well, it has to. Um, that's why I'm very careful to never speak in absolutes and you're not like that either. You're very, we'll see where this goes. We'll tease this out, but it's never, it, the, I hate saying the science is settled on a topic because you, as we continue to grow and learn more, it's never going to be there. 
Well, but that's why we come back to statins as a great example is we knew for years that they benefit mm -hmm. certain patients. The studies showed that time and time again, that there is benefit, but it took years to come back and say, there is residual risk. And that's what I keep coming back to. And it will take us years to really hone in on what's the next uh, statin, if you will, in terms of reducing that risk. But we have to be thinking about other markers outside of the LDL sure. to cover where those statins don't provide benefit to patients. And as you pointed out earlier, there are reasons that, I mean, we have to accept as healthcare practitioners that our patients aren't going to take standard of care. For some reasons, but, you know, for reasons that are their own people, some people don't want to mm -hmm. take statins. There may be side effects. It may be farm, the uh, natural approaches. So I think we have to give patients the options that they want and provide them at the same time with as much information and education as possible along with those options and not just throw things against the walls, correct. what sticks. Because at the end of the day, that's when we have a license to practice is you have that is a responsibility to those patients as well. And so that's sort yeah, of how I, I approach it in the pharmacy too. It's like, I'm never going to, I tell this to people all the time. I'm never going to recommend something to you from a supplement or a nutrition stance that isn't backed up by enough science for me to go, this might have benefit or it might not, you know, as a, if I got, if I knew nothing about pharmacy and I was just an average normal person walking around. And I went to the doctor, said I need to be on this statin. And I went to the store and picked it up. And let's say I read the package insert, which a lot of people read now. When I was, you know, even in a couple of years, I've seen more people reading the package <laughs> insert. And they're like, oh my God, I read the side effect profile. And that's terrifying. I don't want to be on that. It's like, okay, well, it's, they have to, legally, they have to put every possible thing on that package insert that could happen so they don't get sued. That's basically how it works. They have to tease it out. There's years of clinical trials. So they have to be as upfront and honest with you with the information. Does that mean all those bad things are going to happen to you? Probably not. But side effects do happen and they're not rare if they happen to you. I had a professor in pharmacy school always tell us that. He goes, it's not rare if it happens to you. And I'm like, that's a very good way of looking at things. So I think if there's other answers to have to where patients are like, look, I've tried statins felt terrible on them, probably some pharmacogenetic aspect to that. And that's been well established now too, that not many clinicians are aware of or that pharmacists advocate for, but they, if they've tried it and then there's no other alternative option B that can help facilitate that, they're just, patients are just going to get frustrated. Be like, well, I mean, okay, I want my cholesterol down so I don't have a stroke or a heart attack but I don't like the fact that my legs feel like they're getting hit with baseball bats because of the satin. And I, I don't know what to do. It's like, I can't. And if I get off them, then my levels shoot way up. And it's just like, they get, it's frustrating. And it causes a lot of anxiety and other things along with that. And it allows that sentiment to be created to where I don't know who has my best interests at heart. Like, I don't know why I'm not getting any benefit there. And, uh, and to be fair and to be fair and balanced, Patrick, there are those patients that are perfectly happy with their statins. Correct. It's doing exactly what it was supposed to do. It's lowering their LDL and they're thrilled by their LDL levels, but they start to recognize again, there's some, there could be in their specific instance, something that is beyond meaning additive to statins. So you're right. We need to talk about candidly about those folks that aren't satisfied with statins, but we also need to talk about candidly those folks that really are pleased with what their statin is doing, but they're looking for other things to address that residual risk. And I think we have to have that conversation sure. with patients. For sure. There's on another both aspect sides. to that too, that is kind of catching fire, especially like social media and stuff is they'll see there's proponents that kind of go, oh, we, LDL cholesterol is a terrible diagnostic marker for heart disease. Like don't pay attention. It's like, well, you can't say that either because patients that are responding really well on statins and their levels are looking really good. Now you're telling me that the doctors don't know what they're talking about and that they shouldn't be looking at that. So there's so many different schools for thought. And again, it always goes back to this, who do I trust? Like who, okay, one guy's telling me that I need to take a statin to help my LDL. My LDL is improving. Then I hear another reputable source supposedly over here saying that LDL is dumb. We don't need to look at it. And then we have someone who you alluded to that goes cholesterol 
labs are not beneficial in my practice. So it's like you're getting three different schools of thought there and the patient's just caught, they're just spinning out of control and they can't make sense of it. But again, I, it's never as easy as, and as simple as it seems. Like if you get into the mechanisms of even further down the rabbit hole of where this goes, it's a bit overwhelming, but the body is complex and overwhelming. So to say that it's black and white or cut and dry, A plus B equals C mechanism, it's just usually not. I try to stay away from that kind of language because it's just not useful. Now I do, I have a couple other questions going back to, to sesame for you, and then we'll kind of wrap it up a little bit. How we've talked about how it helps with polyunsaturated fatty acid metabolism, how we get that EPA to DHA ratio of in phosphatidylcholine rich DHEA to go down the LCAP pathway to help with HDL. We've also talked about the triglyceride lowering and then the cholesterol remnant lowering piece of that. However, how exact, I know we, you alluded to this earlier about talking about inflammation and stuff too, which is another big buzzword thing that I think we'd like to talk to touch mm -hmm. on. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but like sesame in the papers I've looked at, it helps with really decreasing or not really decreasing, but decreasing and balancing out arachidonic acid production. And it does that by, is it, I think, is it the enzyme, is it Delta-5 desaturase that it helps? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's an inhibitor of Delta-5 desaturase, which basically lowers the amount of omega-6 conversions. Correct. Well, let's, I think this is, I think this is fascinating for pharmacologists, mm -hmm. pharmacists, uh, which as most of your listeners are, many of your listeners are, is the, if you look at polyunsaturated fatty acid metabolism, we know that there are two groups, mm -hmm. omega-6 and omega-3. So there is a single enzyme, right, in that path. So in other words, it's a multi-step process, multi-enzymatic process where we metabolize essential fatty acids, omega-6 and omega-3s. What's really unique about that pathway is these enzymes, and you pointed out the rate-limiting step, delta-5 desaturase, it has an omega-6 mm -hmm. input, and it also can process an omega-3 input. So it's the same enzyme, but it can metabolize either omega-6 substrate or an omega-3 omega precursor. That's important, really important when it comes to sesame, because as you know, and as your listeners know, on the omega-6 side, the output of that enzyme is arachidonic acid. So now we're into leukotrienes, we're into cyclo, you know, it's all sorts of pro and anti-inflammatory markers. On the omega-3 side, the output, the metabolite, if you will, is EPA. Okay. So when you think about delta-5 desaturase, the rate-limiting step, it kicks out arachidonic acid on the omega-6 side, and it kicks out EPA, which is subsequently converted to DHA and further downstream events, right? But So then it begs the question, well, how can I inhibit or, I mean, it, it would not be inhibiting if I'm inhibiting their enzyme, would not be inhibiting arachidonic acid formation and EPA formation simultaneously. So it's a canceling out. Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. This is what's fascinating about sesame. Sesame appears through mechanistic studies, pharmacology studies, in vitro and in vivo to preferentially inhibit the omega-6 mechanism of delta-5 desaturase, meaning it shuts down, not completely, but minimizes or mitigates arachidonic acid formation. And we know that's good in the setting of high arachidonic acid. So that can be anti-inflammatory, while at the same time, it maintains or potentially enhances the EPA formation, subsequent downstream DHA. So that's how a single molecule in sesame seed oil extract can impact inflammation significantly just through that single mechanism of action. And then the other, those folks interested in nutrigenomics, we know that there are two types of individuals and it's race-based. And we can go into this in another call or podcast. You're either a very rapid metabolizer, right? So let's go back to our P450, right? Our drug metabolism language, our poor metabolizer, extensive metabolizer. You're either an extensive metabolizer, meaning you form a lot of arachidonic acid and EPA, and that's the term what your diet is, right? High in omega-6 versus high in omega-3 or vice versa. Okay. And then there's another cohort of individuals for genetic reasons, they're slow metabolizers. 
And so the impact of a bad diet is less in those individuals. And how that sorts out from a racial standpoint is that the more from a genealogical standpoint, genetic standpoint, that African origin people have a much higher chance of inheriting a rapid metabolism. So there have been numerous studies that have said, if you eat high omega-6 and you have an African descent and you're forming lots of arachidonic acid, that's related to obesity and inflammation in general. The non-African origin, so now you're talking about your European Caucasians, they through evolution have acquired a slower form of the gene. So now they metabolize those EPA and arachidonic acid precursors more slowly and the re bad, the result of a bad diet is manifest less in those who have slow metabolism. So that starts to raise this interesting conversation around mm -hmm. racial differences. So your Space Coast vacation is preparing for liftoff. Start counting down now. 10, 9, 8, 7. It's time for a beach vacay that feels like heaven. 6, 5, 4. Come explore Melbourne and the beaches. Three, two, one. It's time for some rocket filled fun. Countdown to your best beach vacation ever on Florida's Space Coast. Launch your planning now at visitspacecoast.com. That's visitspacecoast.com. Ah, feel the whoa with Listerine at BJ's. You can save $2.50 now on Listerine products like Total Care Anti Cavity Fluoride Fresh Mint Mouthwash or Cool Mint Pocket Packs Fresh Breath Strips at your nearest BJ's location. Experience the feeling of a million germs zapped in seconds with Listerine. Discount available through December 24th. Save now only at BJ's. There is every potential that this approach using sesame seed oil extract may have an impact that is differential or differential impact based upon race. Those are all sorts of things that can be looked at in the future, right? But that's just one step on the inflammation side. And I probably went a little deeper mm -hmm. than you no, wanted that's to. Good. That's, you know, that's a great way to think yeah. about and the inflammation that's... piece. Uh, yeah, inflammation is a big buzzword, very important. It's one of those things that's like, you need, let's be honest, you need inflammation for things to work. Like that's not a process you want to completely mitigate or, or whatever. It's good. However. But here's the other important thing from a nutrition standpoint is sesame seed oil for thousands of years was the oil of choice, one of reason, one of the reasons, my main reason is for stability. It's such a high antioxidant oil that it was much more stable than less, uh, well, more stable than those oils that weren't as rich in antioxidants. And so now you've got this, you know, we talked about sesame, we talked about delta-5 desaturation, how that can impact inflammation. But we also know that those mm -hmm. antioxidants in this sesame seed oil and the extract can also positively impact inflammation. Yeah, I and then man, there's so much cool stuff and we didn't even get to touch on the phosphatidyl component <laughs> of like cognition improvement as well as skin improvements too. That's another podcast rabbit hole I want to go down on or want to go down in because that's a whole nother interesting interlude. Like all these systems are interlinked. So it's very interesting when you we start to tease out why it's doing what it's doing and the different aspects of it all. But yeah, inflammation's a, a big one that I think a lot of people, and I, I've talked about inflammation to, to a, a little bit of a degree on some other podcasts. I need to kind of recover it because I am generalizing here, but I think it's not a stretch for me to do this. When people hear, especially on social media or other platforms, they'll hear inflammation. They just think it's all inflammation is the same, and that's not the case. There's differences between acute and systemic. And what I want to point out is when you're talking about CRP, interleukin-6, like other cytokines, inflammatory cytokines that are out there, that is systemic inflammation. And that's not usually something you see acutely raised unless we're dealing with some other situation, sepsis, other things like that. But when you're talking about chronic inflammation, that's what most people are referring to as these systemic blood markers of inflammation that we see time and time again correlate perfectly with these chronic diseases that we've seen on the rise. Well, yeah. well let's bring this full circle, Patrick. And uh, there's a fascinating paper 
that just published, I shared with you via text over the weekend, that looks at independent risk markers for ASCVD. Remnant cholesterol near the top of the list, if not the top of the list. An independent but equally important risk modifier for ASCVD is C-reactive protein. So this chronic inflammatory process, and you distinguish that that's eloquently from acute, right? Where you've got these pro-inflammatory cytokines and the systemic inflammatory response center. We're not talking about that. We're talking mm -hmm. about chronic inflammation. We're talking about C-reactive protein, CRP, and that is a very important marker of risk that again is independent of remnant cholesterol. But what this paper shows is in this very large, I think it was 40,000 plus patient study is when you consider those as independent markers, CRP and remnant cholesterol, that really starts to hone in on what your risk is from an ASCVD standpoint. And that's the fascinating literature. Yeah, it so, was, yes, that paper, you're, need to be that paper you're referring to, was, it was 103,000 patients, I think they looked at in that C-reactive protein paper. I've got it pulled up, I think, or is it? Yeah. Thank you. I'm, that was similar to the 2009 mm -hmm. paper where they looked at statins and risk and, and at residual risk. But yes, the, the large study is the bottom line, right? Thousands of people that looked at CRP and remnant cholesterol, independent, highly in significant in terms of predicting um, ASCVD risk. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you, I think we've hit the nail on the head with it. It's just really cool how it all kind of ties in and works together um, and how you see that really. Oh, here we go. I found it. Here we go. I found that paper. Yeah, you're right. It's like 40,000. Patients, and then I was referring back to the the other one we talked about, where it was over a hundred thousand. So sorry to get that mixed up there. But still, a lot of people, right? That it's not just a hundred person trial and CRP. If you go to LabCorp, for example, and you look at LabCorp, what panel do they offer for inflammation? I mean, I, your father and I run a phase one clinical center. And one of the things we look at is inflammation and C-reactive protein is what LabCorp offers as their general inflammatory marker. So it, that's a really solid marker and it's neat to see that it connects back to ASCVD risk and connects back to independently connects back to the, the remnant cholesterol. So I think that's a great way to sort of think about this. Yeah. Um, one, last, one last aside I want to make because sure. it's another uh, popular thing that's kind of catching wind now because I, I, again, this is I, it's a pet peeve of mine. I feel like for the nutrition world, all of the world's problems have been thrown in some sort of nutrition camp. Like for in the 90s, it was like sugar was the problem. And then before, or I would say the 2000s, it was, okay, sugar is the real cause of issues. And then before that, with it was a low fat diet to the way to go. And now it's kind of, the next one that's kind of catching wind is, oh, it's the seed oils that are causing all these issues that we cook in. It's like, I think if anyone gets anything out of this podcast that we've talked about sesame as much as we've talked about that, I think, I think the case can be made that seed oil is fine and really beneficial. So it's like, again, I think it's funny how they'll lump all the seed oils together. It's like, mm -mm. you know, it's funny you should say that, Patrick, because I literally had that question last week. It says, oh, but I thought, well, the question was, I thought sesame seed oil was banned. So I dug in a little bit. Well, uh, well, because of reading about seed oils and things like that, and to your point, lumping things together. I mean, there's a reason why sesame seed oil was the primary cooking oil for thousands of years. And I'm not saying that it's not detrimental in certain scenarios, but it's not something that science is pointing to as causative for cardiovascular events and uh, at least yeah. from my reading i shouldn't state that so Ses adequate, i mean so my another reason that they use sesame oil for the longest time to cook with is because it's one of the oils to cook with that has the highest smoke point so you're less likely to have bubbling and like if you cook with olive oil at really high temperatures it splashes everywhere it's not fun to deal with but i mean as far as a seed oil or an oil used for cooking that has a high smoke point, but yet actually has flavor enhancing properties, sesame oil is like, I guess like 410 or something like that. I'm, I'm stretching because I had to dive into all of that when I was doing my master's program, we were talking about oils and all sorts of stuff. But again, it, 
Yeah, and I'm a pharmacologist, yeah. not a nutritionist, right? Now, so I got to be very the, careful what yeah. I say about seed oils. And and I, I don't want to. I'm not a seed oil expert either, but I think, yeah. and, and uh, it goes back to the education piece of things because people will go, "Oh, they're highly processed." It's like, okay, a lot of foods that have any sort of packaging or shelf life are processed to a degree, but they'll talk about using from a seed oil perspective, they'll say, oh, well, you have to use all these different solvents to extract the seed oils out and you have to put them in this, these big machines to do all of that and expel the oil out. Okay. Like, I think the big, the big one now is, oh, well, they use hexane to like get the oil separated. It's like, okay, well, if the final end product has zero hexane in it, they have to get all of it out. So whoop to do yeah, you know, you raise an interesting point. I need to ed better educate myself on the pressing versus the use of organics. And I'm not certain. So I'm not saying one way or the other how sesame seed oil is typically processed. But my reading is mainly through just crushing sure. and processing and I'm, not use of hexane. But I, I need to well, educate myself boring. better on that. <laughs> However, I will, I'm pretty <laughs> sure of the seed oils, like you have to do less, less expeller processing and you don't have to do it at higher temperatures for sesame oil it's very easy to cold press sesame oil out as far as sesame seeds in general they have a higher concentration of oil in them as opposed to say corn or canola oil or soybean oil you have to use higher temperature heating to kind of get in more of the product to get that oil extracted out whereas olive oil peanut i think and then Sesame oil, they're just, there's more oil concentrated in the seed itself. So it's easier to cold press it out. So I think for sesame oil, I think most of those are cold press, which most of your olive oil is cold pressed for that exact reason. So it's one of the ones that if I'm going to use, I like that one quite a bit. And again, I don't fry foods very much and I've never heard of, I mean, you can saute things in sesame oil, but I don't think any fries like anything. Yeah, and if you've got any listeners who really want to read, like, go back to Ayurvedic medicine texts and read about sesame seed oil in Ayurvedic medicine. There's a ton of information out there that it's consistent with what we're seeing anecdotally. It's, it's and really fascinating. One last thing I wanted to, to mention. Um, there's, yeah, and we touched on, I don't know if you're, I, I want to pose one question to you because I had a patient ask me this the other day, like literally, yes, Saturday. She came in and she was asking, she's wanting us to, to purchase the product that you've developed, you know, that we're, that we have in this pharmacy. And she was asking if there's any risk for leg cramps or anything that you've seen with using something like sesame in there. And I, I didn't, nothing that I've come across that really would make me think about that to any certain degree, but have you seen that reported anywhere? Cause I know in some cell studies that I've found sesame does have some HMG CoA reductase inhibiting properties. So that's kind of working down that statin pathway to a degree. Have you seen anything in there that you've reported with like leg cramps or anything like that with sesame that, cause that was something that she asked me about, but I was just curious come across anything like that. So let's say two things. First is I am not aware, which does not mean it's not out there, but I am not aware of any muscle related issues for sesame and sesame seed oil extract or using it as a cooking oil. That said, I will dig in and see if I can find anything to be more definitive, but I've read quite a bit about sesame seed oil and sesame, and I'm unaware of any side effect related to that. And we have had no reports anecdotally. Right. So I had neither though. So. But always, right? We're, but as always, right? We're pharmacists. Mm -hmm. We always have our ears open, right? What are some things that are just sort of uh, unexplainable? But the other thing that I want to leave the listeners with is that while this is natural, it is not a pharmaceutical approach. But there's a blurred line between natural and pharmaceutical. And that blurred line is we're still talking about small molecules, phytochemicals in this case, that interact with processes in the body. And so for sesame seed oil and specifically for sesame, which is one of these actives in sesame seed oil extract, there is in vitro work, much like you do for a prescription medication where you're looking at interactions 
between uh, a molecule and cytochrome P450s. There is evidence that sesame is able to modulate CYP 2C9 activity. And so the in vitro studies are more abundant than the in vivo studies. There was one in vivo study done in humans that did not see an interaction, but like I educated students for 20 something years, if it can interact even at the in vitro level, that's why the FDA makes pharmaceutical companies put that information in the package insert, then you as a pharmacist need to be aware that if you see something untoward, then that could potentially be the reason. So again, that's the only, not the only, well, really the only thing that raises my pharmacist awareness when I'm talking about this supplement beyond the oh, yeah. yeah, allergen for the I always, very, I always ask people that too. But yeah, so keep it up to stick to C9. So keep that in mind if you're a practitioner or if you're patient and you're taking other CYP2C9, uh, I said other, if you're taking CYP2C9 mediated metabolism interactions or excuse me, medicines. Yeah, that's uh, CYP2C9 is an interesting one. That's not one of the primary ones, but I'm trying to remember off the Well, it, we know that CYP3A and 4, right? They comprise a vast majority of metabolism. CYP2C9 is rare, but in terms of metabolism of prescription there medications, but there are there. prescription medications that do. Absolutely. And you need to be aware of that when you're yeah, taking I, these together, right? And, you know, your, your dad could lecture us for an hour on herb drug interactions, right? As the world's leading expert, but that's just something I want to make sure is pointed out to yeah, practitioners I and, think and patients. Common ones that come to my mind, like clopidogrel is one that is 2C9, omeprazole is 2C9. Um, the only other one I really see as far as a flu with statin, maybe a little bit, and then, you know, phenytoin. But I mean, some of those you just don't come across very often. But again, that goes, I've said this on the podcast before. I always ask patients whenever I have something, say, do you take any prescription medications? And I have one patient when I asked her that, she goes, you've asked me that every time I've come in here. And I'm like, there's, there's a reason I'm in. It's my job. Um, so it's important. Right. But, right. But that's what I want to point out here as well is just always be aware of the potential. Now, sound back in my pharmacy, you know, professor days is always be aware of the potential, right? For what is it? For worm to forearm mm -hmm. or whatever it is. But anyway, well, Ryan, keep that I in mind. really appreciate you coming on again. I'll have you on multiple times because there's multiple. Every time I talk to you, there's like eight other areas I want to pick your brain on just because we share a lot of the same interests and stuff like that. So I think we've got an interesting really good backed mechanism for what we for how we think's going on and we'll continue to tease that out but you've I, I really like the idea of really harping on the education piece of all of this because that's the key is making how can we take these complex topics make them easier to understand and how we can kind of take all the pieces together and not look at it so compartmentalized you know and just that piece and that holistic approach i think is, is just a great way of tackling complex issues specifically around like cholesterol and risk and all that stuff for heart disease. Well, in offline, we talked about a continuing education talk. It's right beyond LDL tackling residual risk and talking about these things in, in a structured environment and continuing education. That would yeah. be a fascinating. I think people would get a lot of benefit out of that. And I definitely want to pick your brain e and help out there. Um, I, I think we can wrap the episode up and then we'll go from there. I'll, uh, I'll have you on again soon. And, and like I said, I really appreciate your time and always enjoy talking to you. You've been one of the best, you've been one of the, the mentors yeah. that like has always really pushed me to kind of expand my horizons as much as possible in ways of just continuing to stay on the forefront of where all this is going. So I appreciate you with that for sure. More value to me than you well, know. And it, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort in reading and my wife, who's also a pharmacist of 25 plus years, that's what we talk about is the difference maker is the reading and staying abreast of what's new. And that's why the education piece is so important. And why am I at this stage of my career learning about the importance of remnant cholesterol? It, it blows my mind. It, it's, I should have known about it earlier. So yes, it's part of that passion, just educate and podcasts like yours. And the motivations for doing that are really important. And 
you know, maybe we'll get some listeners that'll have questions that, you know, or want to figure out how to help and educate as well and spread the word, so to speak. That's right. So more people understand. Yeah, I like to get that to it. I'd love to get to a point because some of the podcasts I really enjoy do have like a live Q&A component. So that'd be interesting to, to see how I could factor that in later or, you know, just have people submit questions to us and just see where it, and do like a ask me anything kind of episode where we just kind of answer people's questions. I think that would be a cool one to do, especially with you or my dad or your guys' groups. You're right. That, yeah. that would, so I'll definitely work on some of that stuff, Ryan, but I, I really appreciate you being here and thank you for your time. And uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of the Wellness Transcription Podcast. We hope you're inspired to live a healthier, more purpose-filled life in Christ. Remember, your well-being is a gift from God, and by taking care of your body, you give Him the glory. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, share, and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you guys. Your continued support helps us spread this message of health and faith. Until next time, may God's grace and good choices guide your path to a life filled with joy, vitality, and a deeper connection with Jesus. God bless you all, and we'll see you in the next episode. Your Space Coast vacation is preparing for liftoff. Start counting down now. 10, 9, 8, 7. It's time for a beach vacay that feels like heaven. 6, 5, 4. Come explore Melbourne and the beaches. 3, 2, 1. It's time for some rocket-filled fun. Countdown to your best beach vacation ever on Florida's Space Coast. Launch your planning now at visitspacecoast.com. That's visitspacecoast.com. Ah, feel the whoa with Listerine at BJ's. You can save $2.50 now on Listerine products like Total Care Anti-Cavity Fluoride Fresh Mint Mouthwash or Cool Mint Pocket Packs Fresh Breath Strips at your nearest BJ's location. Experience the feeling of a million germs zapped in seconds with Listerine. Discount available through December 24th. Save now only at BJ's.